also be offering refuge to known criminal elements from its Aboriginal neighbour. We're joined on the line by Chuku Emeka Eze of the West African Network for Peace Building. Good evening to you, Mr. Eze. Good evening. And thank you for making, making time. Now, interestingly, I believe you're one Nigerian who calls Ghana home. Are there many like you? Yes, of course. Uh, that is expected in a region where uh, the ECOWAS uh, uh, integration process is actually encouraging um, the cross-border uh, population to be in each other's country and also encourages uh, the transaction of goods and services. You expect that a lot of Nigerians will be in Ghana, especially that both Ghana and Nigeria are Anglophone countries. And also, more importantly, because this is within the spirit of the, 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 the foundation of ECOWAS as a regional economic community. Now, by virtue of that same fact you're talking about, that many are finding themselves, uh, finding Ghana their, uh, their second homes, would you then say that it is uh, inadvertently also harboring or offering refuge to criminal elements? Of course, this is what you expect from this kind of integration process. It comes with the good, the bad, the ugly. And in this instance, you are seeing the other side of it. But I think what is important is the measures that should be put in place so that this kind of activities, this kind of criminal activities does not undermine the ECOWAS integration process. And in my opinion, I think that if you listen to the two inspector generals of police, they have actually hit uh, 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 the nail on the head by discussing how they can have a sub-regional and a community approach to uh, fighting such criminal elements. Is this millionaire kidnapper known to the Nigerian community here in uh, Ghana? I doubt seriously. Uh, this is my, for example, this is my seventh year in the country and I've never come across him. But of course, it's also possible that it's in some cycle he is known. You know, what happens is that such elements, they are holy in the places of their abode, and then they have now uh, where they operate uh, those crimes, uh, uh, where they are uh, in high demand. And in this instance, for the past six to seven years, I'm told that this particular character has been on the radar of the police, because he did not just start as a, 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 a kidnap kingpin, he started as a drug dealer. And to that extent, I think he lived in South Africa for a while, and uh, this was not conducive for him, and then he changed his trade. And also looking at the trend, the trajectory shows that after the introduction of the electronic banking in the system, in most of the countries in the sub-region, it became uh, difficult for them to engage in uh, acts of robbery and burglary. So this is the new trade that they are now engaged in. Now, you just talked about the fact that he found, he lived in South, once lived in South Africa, but didn't find that place conducive. What is it in Ghana that is making it that conducive for him to want to come and uh, settle here or operate from here? Like I said earlier on, uh, you, you, you see where he decides to reside. I don't think he commits those crimes. That's my assumption. And to that extent, uh, so long as he has not committed any crime in Ghana, and so long as he is uh, not in want in terms of his activities, and also including the fact that in South Africa he probably needs a visa to be able to stay, and even a resident permit to stay beyond a certain period of time. Here he has the luxury of 90 days at the minimum. And if he succeeds in getting a resident permit, and in this instance I'm also told that he um, uh, uh, engaged on the, uh, the blind eye of the immigration uh, uh, community and even got himself a passport. So to that extent, you know, and it's difficult really to know, to know who is a Nigerian and who is a Ghanaian just by, by official uh, uh, look. So to that extent, and he also acquired a property. So to that extent, it's difficult to identify him on the, on the radar or on the wanting list so long as he has not committed any crime. But in Nigeria, it is a different case altogether because he committed crime and he is on the watch list of the police. Now, there are some systems in place that are supposed to flag some of these things. For instance, if he's buying property in Ghana, he would have moved some illicit funds, or we're assuming that he would have moved some of the illicit funds to do that. How come the system is not able to pick up some of these uh, exceptions? Well, the, the, these are criminals and 
the point here is there are many of his kind that probably are not lucky. And, and today he is one of those unlucky ones. But it also does not mean that we have 100% uh, uh, um, situation here where nothing ever uh, gets on the blind eye. In this instance, for example, there are so many options that is available to him that as a criminal he can exploit. For example, is it that he can, he can uh, come with this money in, in cash? That's a possibility. Um, he can come with it over a period of time and he is not caught. Or he can even uh, use some of his members of the, his family or his gang to bring in the funds. That's a possibility. Is it also possible that in, a, in, in uh, purchasing such uh, 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 property, he is also colluding with as a, a Ghanaian, uh, which is also possible. There are too many ways those criminals can beat the system, but it only takes a while, and uh, today I don't think he is as lucky as he used to be yesterday. All right, now, taking yourself away from being the expert we're speaking to and being a, a Nigerian yourself, are you worried when you hear such stories? Because it, gets, it tends to feed into the narrative that uh, Nigerians uh, are domiciled in Ghana and sometimes engage in crime. Well, this is what you get um, uh, in most urban cities in, in Africa. This is what you get. Um, uh, it, it doesn't matter the percentage of the people living in another country. So, so long as uh, uh, even 1% is committing crime, it is a dent on the entire nation. And, and to that extent, um, it's not only a dent to the Ghanaian authority in terms of the security apparatus, but now uh, a, a, a national shame to to the country, Nigeria. So uh, if you hear this kind of thing, it undermines the effort of other citizens who are here to do legitimate business. And it also goes to uh, increase the perception you know, of the security agents or even the state against a certain uh, 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 other country. So you won't be surprised if there is a now increased vigilance on a Nigerian citizen coming into the country if people don't know uh, what kind of business you're doing. So people, it's also undermines tourism. So legitimate people that even come to stay for a while uh, and look around because of this, uh, taking advantage of this integration agenda of ECOWAS, they might find it difficult to be allowed into the country, except they give you know, all uh, uh, proof about their, their mission. And this is not the intent of the founding fathers of ECOWAS. Thank you very much, uh, Chuku Emeka Eze of the West African Network for Peace Building. And he was uh, sharing some insights into the story that's uh, coming up. Uh, the Nigerian IGP is uh, cautioning or urging Ghanaian authorities to be worried about the activities of criminal elements who are operating. And it, it follows the uh, exposure or the revelations that one uh, Nigerian kidnapper a uh, notorious kidnapper actually is, uh, has a Ghanaian passport and is domiciled here in Ghana or has his family domiciled here in Ghana.